Between this week and next, we're going to be concluding the series that we're in, Victory, Defeating the Antichrist. And through this series, we've, we've walked through a lot of different ways of how we can fight against this spirit, this antichrist spirit that John said was in the world in the, the book of 1 John already, that the Antichrist spirit means that it's in the world today, and that ultimately we're going to see an Antichrist that comes on the scene. And some of the ways that we've talked about this is standing firm on the truth of God's word, that this book is true, it's completely true, and we believe it to be true, and that we hold on to it no matter what goes on in our life. We talked about serving others, like we were just mentioning, about taking care of orphans, taking care of widows, taking care of those that are in need, because Jesus met us at our lowest moment and took care of us. Now that we are looking more like Jesus and stepping into relationship and faith with Jesus, that means we need to serve others. You don't get to say, well, Jesus, you served me, and now I'm just going to live a good life. No, we got to get plugged in. we got to serve. Thank you to each and every one of you that came for four nights this past week to do VBS so that kids could meet Jesus and spend time with Jesus in a safe and fun place. Thank you for coming and serving. That we talked about unity a couple weeks ago, that we can either be building up the kingdom of God or we can be tearing it down. And how many of you know building the kingdom of God works a little bit better than tearing down the kingdom of God? And then last week we dove into that whole topic of finances, that the best way to beat the Antichrist and that one world economy that we can get so worried about of, well, the mark of the beast and 666 and I can't buy and sell, just invest in God's kingdom. Invest in God's kingdom. Because when the, the rapture happens, whenever it happens and we're caught up, we're going on the first trip up, and then ultimately if I'm building God's economy and I'm trusting and placing my hope and my faith in Jesus Christ, then I don't need to be scared of anything that happens in this world because I know at the end of the day that Jesus wins. Got to be a little bit more excited about that. At the end of the day, Jesus wins. There we go. And so next week we're going to end the series by talking about how we need to enthusiastically go after Christ. So I'm giving you a warning. Next week, drink the, the large coffee. Drink two energy drinks. Come in, be ready to go because I'm, if I'm enthusiastic today, I'm going to drink three energy drinks before I come in next week. Because we need to be enthusiastic about the things of God. Amen? We need to be enthusiastic about the things of God. Amen? There we go. But uh, today we're going to be talking about in order to defeat the Antichrist spirit, we need to put our faith in Christ. And so putting our faith in Christ is critical. And in this day and age, what better way to fight against the Antichrist spirit than by going after the one who saved us in the first place. But before I start diving in, would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, your word is written in my mind and hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp onto my feet and a light onto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. My greatest desire is to be a disciple and to make more disciples. I will live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. We live in a time when the battle between the kingdom of God and Satan feels like it's heating up like it never has before. That all of a sudden it starts becoming like this really matters. That it may not have felt that way 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, or, I mean, not that any of us were aware of it, 100 years ago. But ultimately, one of the reasons why it feels like it's heating up is we are, every day, we're getting closer to the return of Jesus. And sometimes I know that can be kind of a throwaway statement because, yes, we are closer right now to the return of Jesus than we were at the beginning of service. And now we're also closer. And now we're also closer. So I know sometimes it can kind of feel that throwaway statement, but in truth, you start get this ramp up of emotion, this ramp up of energy, that you start seeing things happening in the news, you start seeing things happen around the world, and you start saying, well, it does feel like Jesus is getting closer. And when the return gets closer, there's more energy because Jesus is doing what Jesus needs to do. Satan's giving everything he's got, which, by the way, like I've mentioned the last couple of weeks, that Satan is nothing more than a scared little chihuahua talking into a, a microphone, trying to amplify his little bark, but you have the ability, sorry, Peter, to just kick Satan out of the way. Let me give you a practical example of this. Yesterday, Pastor Frank and I went to the Lions game. 
Now, of course, if you watch the news, you're like, oh, well, they lost. That must have been a bummer of a game. We didn't go for the sake of seeing them win. Now, if they had won, it would have been great. We almost don't care about winning because the goal is let's try this player over here and let's try this with that. Our starters didn't play yesterday because they're, they're playing around like our second string quarterback played the first half of the game. The better a team is, the more you start saying, I'm not worried about a preseason game. I'm trying matchups. I'm trying this. I'm trying that. Even Lydia, she looked at me and like, well, aren't you going to take me? I'm like, Lydia, I'm going to take you to a game where it matters. Because you get to a regular season game, and you start saying, well, this game actually matters. It's one of 17, that whoever wins the most gets to go to the playoffs and then potentially goes to a Super Bowl. I can tell you this, the, the stadium was excited yesterday, but at the same time, it's not a regular season excitement. Because yesterday's game doesn't mean anything. You can lose all three preseason games, and still go to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. I guarantee nobody's asking the Kansas City Chiefs, how many preseason games did you win last year? Because they won the trophy that matters. And so in the, the room and in the atmosphere, there wasn't that same ex excitement. When you got to the fourth quarter, when it's, well, the Lions could still come back and win this game, it wasn't about that. There wasn't that same level of excitement of, well, we need to start rallying. We need to start doing two-minute drills. We need to start getting the crowd going and cheering the energy in the room was different. But when we start looking at Jesus returning, you start feeling that difference between what a preseason game is and then the final moments of a game where it is tight and the winner gets to go to the Super Bowl. Imagine if yesterday was the, the game that would send the Lions to the Super Bowl. I guarantee if I was there, I would not have a voice today. Because I would be cheering, I would be exciting, I would be fully believing that my screaming would be helping them play better. Of course, that's not true, but in my mind it is. And so that's what's going on in our world today. You start feeling things ramp up, you start feeling emotions of, well, why is this person so upset about this, and why are they so upset about that? It's because it's getting closer to Jesus returning. And the closer Jesus is to returning, the more energy, the more things start kind of ramping up. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus is coming back tomorrow. He could. It doesn't mean that he's coming back next year. He could. But we are every day, every year, closer and closer to that moment. And so Satan is doing everything he can to take as many people with him as he can. But ultimately, we just have to put our faith in Jesus. So let me go ahead. I want to start reading in 1 John 2, verses 18 to 23. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth." Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So what's stra Satan's strategy in these days to come? It's to replace Christ. Let this one sink in for a moment. Satan's strategy is to replace Christ. The working of the spirit of the Antichrist is going to intensify and continue to intensify as we get towards the end of the age. But let's break down this word Antichrist for a moment. And so I'm going to forewarn you, I don't always do a lot of like, well, this is what it means in the Greek. Today I'm going to be doing that a little bit more than I would typically. Uh, the word Christ is from the Greek, meaning Christos, which exactly corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, which is where we get Messiah. So ultimately, when we say anti-Christ, we say anti-Messiah. Anti is a Greek preposition. It has two meanings, and both of them apply in this particular case. First of all, it means against. So the anti-Christ's first play is to be against the Messiah. But the second meaning is this, is it's in place of. The ultimate purpose of the antichrist is to be a false Messiah, to take the place of Jesus. And you ultimately see this happen a lot throughout, uh, throughout time. 
is first is you have people that were against the church or were against Christ. You start looking at dictators and different people throughout the, the years that it's easy to say, well, this person is an antichrist. Or maybe this person is the antichrist. Ultimately, everybody who has come before is not the antichrist. And most of the people, like I said in week one of the series, that you think are the antichrist likely aren't the antichrist. But they can be a type of, they can be leading in that particular direction. That when we go back to the verse that we read in the week one of the series, 1 John 4, 2 through 3, it says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So if we take 1 John 4 and we take it with 1 John 2 that we just read, we see three different forms of this Antichrist uh, come on the play. First of all is the many Antichrists that have come throughout human history. This is where you could throw someone like Hitler into this list, somebody who would do horrific things that Hitler used the Bible to justify what he was doing to the Jews. That when you take somebody who takes and manipulates Scripture to justify doing atrocities, that starts to put them into that category of being like the Antichrist. Secondly is the actual Antichrist. For those that you might play video games, this is when you get to the final boss, the big bad, that you all of a sudden you're going through and you think that you beat the game, and then all of a sudden, well, here's the last one. Here, if you beat this one, you beat the game. Now, here's the thing I can tell you about every video game that's ever been designed to my knowledge. You're supposed to be able to beat the final boss. I'm not aware of any video game where you beat the final boss and then all of a sudden there's a big screen on the, uh, that comes across your TV that says, end of the game, you lose. You beat the final boss, you win the game. And so ultimately you have this antichrist that is going to come on the scene, that is going to come in the book of Revelation, that's going to have this one world economy, this one world government, that's going to ultimately sit on the, the temple uh, throne and declare that he is God because it's not just being against the Messiah, he's going to declare himself the Messiah in place of. And then the third form is the spirit of the Antichrist that we're talking about, that we see that's in this world, and that ultimately all three of these spirits, that they're, they're, they're in play, they're operational. And here's the thing, that the spirit starts in association with God's people. I want, I want you to see this because this is actually a little bit scary when we really pay attention. And this is why we have to come back to knowing God's word so that nobody, myself included, could ever push or manipulate you into believing something that scripture doesn't say. That when we go back and we look at 1 John 2.19, it said, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all, or they all are not of us. The, this Antichrist spirit that is talked about almost always begins in some way in association with the people of God. I'll give you a first example. The Pharisees, they're associated with the people of God. They know the word of God. But they're not believers in Jesus Christ. They are not for Jesus Christ. So if they're not for Jesus Christ, by process, that means that they're anti-Jesus Christ or anti-Christ because they're against him. They're not trying to themselves replace uh, Jesus. So that's why they can't be that final version of the Antichrist. But they are against him and they want to replace him. 1 John 2.22 says, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Messiah. The Pharisees were denying that Jesus was the Messiah. But it continues on to first, in 1 John 2.22 that he is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. When you start saying that Jesus was not the Son of God, you start getting yourself in a situation where you're saying that he's not the Messiah, that I want a replacement, I want someone different. The Pharisees wanted a political leader. They didn't want who Jesus was. They didn't want someone who was speaking softly and speaking about love and speaking about grace. They wanted someone who would come in and take out the Romans. When we look at John 5.18, it said, This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, him being Jesus, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The Pharisees were of the people But they didn't stay with the people, and so they begin entering into that antichrist spirit. 
And so this is what's important is that we have this continual relationship with God that we realize Jesus being the son of God is critical, it's important. It is something when I talk about open-handed theology and close-handed, Jesus has to be the son of God or nothing matters. Everything we do does not matter if Jesus is not the son of God. Now, one of the things you'll hear today is, well, well Judaism and Christianity and uh, Islam, they're all the same. They all are dealing with the same thing. Judaism denies that Jesus is the son of God. They might, someone might believe that Jesus was a good teacher, that he was um, uh, a rabbi, but they're not saying that he's the, the Messiah. So that is not lined up. Now, I have hope and faith for those that are Jewish, that they would be able to come into the fold and accept Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. But ultimately, that gives them a little struggle. We'll, we'll deal with the other issue in just a minute. But this is another reason why you don't see me push for political leaders. You don't see me push for famous people. Because my faith is not in a single person other than the person of Jesus Christ. Anyone else who will ever tell you, well, I'll do this for you and I'll do that for you, can ultimately fail you. Because guess what? They are people just like we are people. And how many of you are perfect in this room? I want, I, like, if you're perfect, raise your hand up high. Yeah, I don't see any. Mine's not up either because none of us are perfect people. Only Jesus was perfect. So my faith must be in Jesus. But that raises the question, what is faith then? Let's, with that in mind, let's break down what the word faith really means. If we go to the dictionary, we see that faith is a complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And I love how it, it phrases that, a complete trust. Not just a trust, not just a hope, a complete trust that Jesus is who Jesus says he is. If I'm putting my faith in him, I have a complete trust that if God's saying this, if God's doing this, that I can trust that God will come through for me. The, the word emuna is the Hebrew word that is most often translated as faith. In Western culture, our concept of faith usually becomes very passive. Like, I have faith in God. I believe that if that's what God's will is, that I believe that he can do it. But it's not active. It's not expectant. It's not hopeful that we can walk into church on a Sunday morning of, I have faith that Jesus could save my loved ones. He hasn't yet, and I don't know when he's going to, but I believe he could. That's not faith, at least not according to the scripture. In the Jewish culture, when we get the word emuna, it is action-oriented, involving active support, and places the action upon the object, as in we support God. When I say I have faith in God, I'm supporting God, that God's word says this, then God's word is going to do this. And if it hasn't happened yet, then maybe it's not God's timing, maybe it's not God's will in this particular moment, but God is fully able. And when I pray with someone, I fully expect them to be able to be healed. I fully expect them to be able to be delivered. I fully expect that God's going to deliver the promises that his word says, that God's promises are yes and amen. And if it just hasn't happened yet, either this isn't God's will in this moment, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to place my hope in my faith because I know that God can do what God's word says he can do. But let me just say this for a second. And this, if you get nothing else from this entire message, I want you to get this. Faith is not a passive tool that we use so that God gives us what we want. Ultimately, faith is what we need so we can stand firm when we don't get what we want. Let that sink in for a moment because sometimes it's like, well, I have faith that, that God can do it. That's not faith. Because that's not complete trust. Complete trust is God's word said it, so God's word can do it. That God created everything. I believe that God can take care of this circumstance and this situation. If he doesn't, then God's still God. God's still good. But I fully believe that God can do this. That I have faith when I don't get what I want. So I can stand firm. I can stand with confidence because I know that no matter what the enemy forms and throws at my uh, direction, it will not prosper because I am in Christ. I am a new creation. The old is gone. The new is come. And God is in control. And so my faith is rooted in who God is, not what my circumstances look like, not what I feel like in this moment. When I feel weak, in my weakness, he's made strong. The more we acknowledge of who God is and how do we do that, because we keep coming back and standing firm on the word of God. You can't have authentic, strong faith until you know what God's word is, until you spend time in his presence. 
And so the more we do all of these things together and we serve other people, when we serve other people, we get excited because look at what I was able to do with God. And if I'm able to do this with God, then what, can I, what else can I do? What can I learn that I want to be able to answer people's questions when they want to know about who God is? Then i got to know who God is. i got to spend more time reading his word. i got to spend more time in prayer. I've got to build up that relationship with God so that I can serve people in a better way. That God, you gave me everything. You gave me the breath that I'm, I'm taking right now. So God, if you ask me to give this, you ask me to do this, you ask me to go, you ask me to give up everything and go to the other side of the world to be a missionary, then absolutely I'll do it because Jesus saved me. This world doesn't matter when we're in Christ because we are passing through. We are in but not of this world. So let me even just take this and give a specific example. And I want to give something that is historic and it's current, yet it's potentially controversial. But I'm going to say it anyways because truth is truth and I can't hold back truth. A primary manifestation of the spirit of the Antichrist today and again, this is not popular, and I wouldn't be surprised if this gets me flagged on YouTube, but uh, hey, YouTube, go for it. Uh, a primary manifestation of the spirit of the Antichrist today is found within Islam and the religion of Muhammad. Now, again, a couple moments ago, I made that statement that people a lot of times will pair Christianity and Islam and Judaism and throw them all together and say that all of them are the same, they all worship the same God. If you deny Jesus Christ is the Son of God then you do not believe in the same God that Christianity believes in. Judaism, we just mentioned, the Pharisees denied who Jesus was. They denied the sonship of Jesus Christ to the Father. So now, Muhammad arose in the 7th century in the Arabian Peninsula, claiming to be a prophet. And this is, let me just make this side comment for a moment. Always have your spiritual guard up when someone's claiming to be a prophet, because they very well could be. But I want you to guard yourself that you are checking what they're saying against God's word because God does not contradict himself. And so if, if you know God's word and you hear a prophecy and you're like, I don't know about that. That doesn't really line up with what God's word says. Then it probably isn't a prophetic word for you. But he claimed to be a, a prophet and to receive from an archangel the revelation of the religion that became Islam. Again, here's one of the things I love with the Bible. The Bible is made up of numerous people writing it over thousands of years, and you cannot find a contradiction. And when someone says, well, here's a contradiction, yeah, you can easily explain, the, well, this is what this means. You took that out of context. But when you look at the, the found, founding of Islam, it's one guy said, hey, by the way, I got a revelation. This is what the word is. By the way, I got a revelation that God's word says you all have to give me all your money and deposit it into my bank account today. So if you want to go to heaven, you got to do this. That's ridiculous. But that's you trusting one person. We're trusting the Holy Spirit speaking to multiple men over the course of thousands of years with no contradictions and historical evidence to back it up. So he claimed that Islam was the true fulfillment of the Old and the New Testaments. Go back to, for a second to 1 John chapter 2. They started with us, but then they left us, and they're not of us because they left us. So he claimed Islam was the true fulfillment of the Old and the New Testament, claiming that Christians and the Gospels perverted the real truth, but he was restoring it. Islam bears most of the marks of the spirit of the Antichrist. It starts with the association of the Old and New Testaments. It claims to be the outworking of the revelation of God, but it denies certain fundamentals of the Christian faith, like these two in particular. The atoning death of Jesus on the cross. One of the things I always tell you, open-handed, close-handed theology, Jesus had to be born of, of, of a woman. He had to live a sinless life. He had to go to the cross. He had to die on our behalf. And he had to be resurrected and ascend back to heaven. Muhammad taught that Jesus did not die on the cross, but an angel came and spirited him away before he died. Because there is no death, there is no atonement. Because there is no atonement, there is no forgiveness. And that's why that religion has a group of people wandering, trying to find peace because there is no peace, because there is no forgiveness, because they deny the very thing that Jesus Christ did for them. The second thing is this, is that Islam denies that Jesus is the Son of God. You can talk to Muslims about Jesus as a prophet, and they will give you careful attention. The Quran acknowledges Jesus was a prophet, but the moment you say that Jesus is the Son of God, all of a sudden everything changes. 
Even when you go to the Dome of the Rock, which the Dome of the Rock is built on the site where the temple is, which someday in the future, in order to get the book of Revelation to play out the way that it needs to play out, the Dome of the Rock is going to have to go away so that a third temple can be built, so that the Jews are able to worship again, where the Antichrist will ultimately sit and try and steal it because he is trying to be a replacement Messiah, but he's not a replacement Messiah because our God is coming again and he's going to come down on a white horse and he's going to set up shop and he's going to take care of Satan forever and reign for a thousand years and then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But on the Dome of the Rock, built on that site, there is an Arabic inscription around it that says twice, God has no need of a son. Please don't tell me that all religions are the same and all religions lead to the same place. No, there is one truth. It is the truth of Jesus Christ who came and he lived the perfect life. He died on our behalf. He was buried. He was resurrected on the third day. He ascended back to heaven and he is coming again. And he is coming soon. So we need to keep our faith in Christ and encourage others to do so as well. 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul deals with the Antichrist's appearance, revelation, manifestation. He addresses the preparation for the Lord's return. And they're all these things are closely intertwined because the final satanic attack before the return of the Lord will reveal the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3 says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. The word coming uh, that is parousio in the Greek is usually associated with the second coming of Jesus. So Paul wrote, don't be shaken and don't be troubled, neither by your spirit or by word or letter, because he knew that the Christians of the time and Christians of our time would be shaken that, well, this looks like it's falling apart and that's falling apart and this person's saying this and this false theology is saying that. False theology is not a new thing. People have been trying to manipulate the word of God from the beginning, but the word of God cannot be manipulated or perverted because it's the word of God. And when you start getting away from this, then all of a sudden it becomes what your truth is, and I have no interest in your truth. I have an interest in his truth. So ultimately, as we look at this, there is a falling away that happens, that this is where um, the, the Greek apostia, apostasia, meaning apostasy, is a deliberate rejection of revealed truth. Look at our world today and say that there's not apostasy going on. Of people deliberately saying in and out of the church, well, that's not true. I'm not accepting that. This isn't this. It's, I mean, entire denominations of Christianity are being split right now over differences of beliefs of what Scripture says and doesn't say. That should open our eyes to the fact that there is a falling away that happened. Even when we look through the, the course of 2020, when you look at stats uh, that happened in different churches, you see that a lot of people use 2020 and political things and masks and vaccinations and all that to be their reason, well, I'm not going back to the church because I don't feel safe at church. And it's amazing that you feel safe in Walmart. And let's just be honest, I don't feel safe on Walmart on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> but we're not safe right here right now. And so people use that as a reason for my falling away from, from God. No, you were already falling away. That just was kind of a, a, um, a moment where we kind of said, here's the people on the left and here's the people on the right, which, by the way, that ends up happening in the book of Revelation where the goats and the sheep get separated. I almost look at it as here is a moment where God's intentionally allowing his church to be pruned so that the church can have one more growth, one more big moment where we can bring people into the fold and teach the unperverted truth so that people can meet Jesus before Jesus comes back again. And church, that's why we have to be game on. We cannot fake our way through this. This is what excites me so much where uh, we are having water baptism after water baptism and we have four more coming in the next month that I want... 
I want to be able to fill this thing up every single week. That would be no greater joy than the water bill coming in. It's like, well, why are you using so much more water? Well, city employee, let me tell you why we're using water. Because we're baptizing people because people are meeting Jesus and having their life changed and transformed. And this church is, is growing. Hey, we got to tear up the parking lot. Let's fix the parking lot finally because the tr church is growing and we need more room. We need more space. Let's figure out a way that we can build a parking garage. I don't really care, but we need to do things so that people meet Jesus. By the way, next week's message is enthusiastically following after Christ. If you can't see I'm there, I need you to get there for next week. That's your, your homework. Drink extra coffee or extra energy drinks next week. But that passage that we just read offers two more titles of the Antichrist. First is the man of sin or the man of lawlessness is the su supreme embodiment of man's rebellion against God and rejection of God's laws. We see it happening over and over again. We start seeing people fighting against God's rules. There's going to be someone that comes and rallies them all together, and it's going to be next level. And then we also see the term son of perdition, meaning the one who is headed for a lost eternity. Satan's already lost. Satan is nothing more than a big loser. But what Satan's trying to do is, I'm going to try and get as many people on my side as possible. Because he, he is the Titanic, he's sinking, and he's trying to get people to not jump off uh, onto the lifeboats. We need to not be listening to his voice. We need to be listening to the voice of Jesus Christ. And so we then see one more name that comes for him. This is Revelation 13, 1 through 4. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave power in his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast and they worshipped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like the beast and who can fight against it ultimately what's going on here the beast representing the antichrist that had a wound they made it look like it was dead and it's back to life because satan can't create anything he's a manipulator he's a copier he's attempting because he wants to look like a messiah what's he going to do the the common belief is that there is going to be an assassination attempt on the Antichrist. The Antichrist will look like he is dead, but will come back to life again because he's trying to mirror Jesus, but he isn't Jesus. And so he can attempt to do it, but he's not going to win. Satan is a loser. And ultimately, here's the thing, is when we get to Revelation 5.5, 5, John sees a vision of a scroll in the hand of God, and no one was found worthy to open the scroll. So John was weeping, but one of the elders said, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. It's easy to look at the Antichrist as this intimidating beast of all how it's described. And the lion of the tribe of Judah is described as a lamb that was the perfect sacrifice for your behalf and my behalf. My faith, my active faith, faith my complete trust must be in Jesus Christ. It has to be. Worship him if you would come forward. I want to finish again by looking at 2 Thessalonians 2-3. through 3. Or two, three. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day the coming of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. I firmly believe that that day is here. Whether that means that we have a month, a year, a decade, I don't know the amount of time we have, but look at our world and you can see a great falling away is happening. You can see that people are falling away from the church, but here's the thing that I know, as long as Jesus has not returned and there's breath in my lungs and there's breath in someone else's lungs, there's still time, there's still opportunity for them to meet Jesus and to build their life on Jesus. It means that we are in the fourth quarter. It means that we have the opportunity to make it to the Super Bowl. It means that we have the opportunity to win the big game for God. But we have to do what we are called to do so that we can advance the kingdom of God. We can make Jesus' name famous. So this morning, here's what I want to encourage you to do. The altars are going to be open. First off, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your life before, today can be your day. 
It simply is that matter of saying, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you change me? Would you transform me? That I'm a mess. My life is full of sin. I have all these regrets. I make all these mistakes. Would you come in and change me? There is no magical prayer that you have to pray. But I want you to come to the altar, and we're going to open this altar to everyone, so no one's going to know why you're coming. But I want you just to come forward and just say, Jesus, would you just be Lord of my life? Would you forgive me? Would you set me free from my past mistakes, from my faults and from my failures? And I want you to pray that as we're uh, just having this time of worship to close service. And then go to our welcome center following service and talk with one of us uh, that, that is there. Find me and just say, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. What's my next step? Because we'd love to point you in that direction. But for everyone else in the room, we need to take this serious. We need to put our faith and our hope, our complete trust in Jesus Christ, giving him everything, living for him alone. Because there is an antichrist that's coming that's going to deceive people. We need to make sure that we cannot be deceived, but that also we are prepared to give an account of what Jesus Christ has done in our life and how he's changed us, how he's transformed us. And we build our life to say, you know what, Jesus, you and only you, I want to live for you. So we need you to stand up. The worship team is going to lead us in Build My Life. And this altar space is, is free. Come up here, worship the king. Give him the praise and the, the glory that he deserves. Thank you.